Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you hear me? Is this mic on? Okay, great. So um, I'm Ken. Uh, I'm from Utah, and I'm going to be um, providing some external feedback, um, thoughts on recommendations for electronic phenotyping. Uh, just as some disclosures, in the past year, I've been a consultant or a sponsored researcher on clinical distance support for uh, Office of National Coordinator for Health IT, primarily uh, also uh, some for Hitachi and McKesson mm -hmm. and Dirk Wall. So just because uh, uh, I don't think I know many folks here, um, just as some background. So um, on one hand, I'm primarily operational. I'm uh, actually currently uh, allocated about 80% effort to operational duties. Um, I'm Associate Chief Medical Information Officer at our health system. Uh, I oversee our operational clinical distance support work. So you know things like the Epic Best Practice Advisories, Health Maintenance, the Medication Alerts, that kind of thing. I'm the person who oversees you know just like the regular Epic things around that. I've also done a, a decent amount of work in quality measurement, doing things like uh, building uh, quality measures used for physician compensation in our uh, community clinics, things like that. Uh, and I'm spending a lot of my effort now on uh, interoperable applications and services that we build on top of our Epic EHR, things like smart on fire applications, uh, things like uh, external distance support that uh, we're integrating. Um, so that's one hat. Um, uh, and then on the other hand, I've been engaged a lot in standards development and implementation. Uh, I've been uh, co-chair of the HL7 Clinical Distance Support Work Group for a number of years. Uh, I founded with NHRI support, actually, um, through our K Award, uh, OpenCDS a long number of years ago. And now uh, we use that across our organization, number of companies, et cetera, for uh, providing clinical distance support that's standards-based, um, uh, that's uh, all open source. Uh, I also uh, coordinated efforts from the Office of National Coordinator for Healthy Decisions and Clinical Quality Framework, which were initiatives around developing and validating standards mm -hmm. for uh, quality measurement and uh, distance support. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, up-and-coming Health IT Advisory Committee um, that's um, just getting set up. So uh, uh, with just that background, I'm going to go right into uh, some of these questions. So. The first one is, uh, how can eMERGE improve upon the current labor-intensive phenotyping towards more fully automated phenotyping methods to increase phenotyping efficiency and validity using EMRs? And I'll just note here, uh, George talked a lot about, you know, or some, about the differences between uh, what the purpose is, right? So for research cohort purposes, you really want high positive predictive value. You don't care if you miss a bunch of patients. Uh, for uh, distance support kind of purposes, you care about collecting as many patients because the doc doesn't like it when you miss 40% of their patients when you're taking care of patients say, oh, this rest, other 60% will, will recommend for you. I think uh, along the lines of the clinical angle too, there's also differences in, uh, in those approaches in terms of how scalable you want it to be. So if it's meant for primarily research uh, by eMERGE sites, then I think it's totally fine for it to be a highly resource-intensive effort that costs millions of dollars of research funding to get accomplished. I think that's appropriate. If you want to get towards how do we scale this to be able to be used at health systems, academic, community hospitals with relatively minimal resources and a lot of competing demands, then you have to think, how can I scale this without all those uh, kinds of resource needs? Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'd say my biggest uh, uh, big picture recommendation is pretty straightforward. It's to learn from and synergize with uh, related efforts. So I think this is kind of a straightforward recommendation, but it's actually really hard to execute on. It's just not something we uh, typically do very well. So uh, the underlying this is first the understanding that electronic phenotype is really a common problem encountered in other areas. Uh, certainly beyond genomics, right? So if you think about most health IT, um, uh, operational informatics kind of things we, we do research, a lot of it just comes down to how do you characterize, you know, you go from data to information. So this is certainly beyond genomics, beyond eMERGE. This goes all over the place, right? So there's a lot of efforts, obviously. Uh, there's in efforts in data standardization, clinical distance support, electronic clinical quality measurement. And I think what this means is if you synergize, you will have more resources because there are more people trying to solve the problem. And I think importantly, you could have more adoption. I think one of the challenges uh, I've encountered in, in my career working on standards and say the distance sports space is when you create standards just for your area, then people, the EHR vendors don't adopt it as much, right? I think the key th question here is can you come up with standards that the EHR vendors will natively adopt that you don't have to wrangle fight with to make it happen? I think I looked at the roster list and I didn't actually see any EHR vendors coming to this conference. And I think that's something to think about, right? Like, in the end, 
most of us use commercial EHR systems. We need it, what we do to be supporting those commercial EHR systems. And I think um, going with an approach that those vendors are looking to support is really, really important because otherwise there's a high chance when they adopt something, you'll have to rework everything to meet their approach. Um, so just getting into some uh, specifics around that notion of uh, working with uh, others and uh, using um, uh, what I think are uh, important trends emerging. One is I'd recommend using the HL7 clinical quality language or CQL. So this was developed by the own CCMS CQF initiative. And the reason why I really recommend this, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you'd recommend certain standards because it's better or it's more semantically pure, that kind of thing. What I learned is it's really important to understand where this trend of the industry is going. And I think the trend of the industry is going this way. Um, I think primarily uh, this is because CMS has announced it'll start using CQL for its electronic clinical quality measures, which means essentially if you want to get paid by CMS, you'll need to support this, this standard. I think is the way it's going to happen. So I think HR vendor support is likely to start emerging, and I think aligning with that is uh, a really good idea. So uh, I won't go into detail, but this just shows what CQL looks like in the human readable form. Uh, this is for quality measurement for diabetes food exams. Uh, obviously, you can do much more complex things. Just showing, you know, it's like any other standard. We've had numbers of standards. I, I think a lot of times the the just of the standard isn't necessarily, you know, is it better than another? It's whether vendors are going to adopt them or not. And I think uh, this probably has the best chance right now of being adopted. Um, uh, along those lines, uh, I would recommend building on the FHIR US score profile. So uh, this is where EHR vendors are focusing in terms of their uh, support for uh, FHIR APIs, which is their main approach they're using now for exposing uh, their data. Um, so. Uh, anyone who's worked for, with this knows it's far from perfect, right? So like medications, they'll encode the medication codes using ARCS norm codes, but there's nothing in the US core fire profile that says the route needs to be, you know, an FDA code. So we end up, you know, pulling it from our EPIC EHR and we get institution specific route codes that we have to map. You know, there's things like that that has to be addressed, but I think this offers a pretty good baseline uh, of fairly uh, wide support. And my recommendation to this group would be don't ignore this, engage directly with it for things you want, try to get it uh, uh, worked on here, and work with the vendors to get it supported. I, the, essentially, what you need, the process ends up being convince the vendors and the community and the healthcare systems that this is a really important use case that must be supported, and then work with the vendors to make sure it, it gets supported. Uh, and this just shows uh, what that looks like um, on the FHIR website. Um, really not rocket science, but it sets things like, okay, you know, the status of the uh, condition needs to be from this uh, value set, that kind of thing. Things we do everywhere, every single group that's going to work on something like this is going to define this. You know, you can make arguments of is this the right approach, is that the right approach? But I think the key question is, you know, is your vendor going to support it? Because if it doesn't, then you're going to have to do the mapping. Um, uh, here I just call out that um, uh, there's really important work going on here for uh, two initiatives, both uh, led by Stan Huff, uh, CMIO at um, Intermountain. Uh, one is the HL7 Clinical Information Modeling Initiative, or CIMI, where the insight here is that if you want true interoperability, you really need detailed clinical models. It's in insufficient to say you'll have an observation with the code and a value. It just, anyone who's tried to do this realizes that just doesn't work sufficiently. So. Um, uh, what this effort is trying to do is to get from a position where we have standards, where every time you try to implement, you make you know, judgment calls. You say, should I implement it using this structure or that structure? Is it a procedure or is it an observation? What should I use for this code? What should I use for the value? What should I do for the units? Should I add a body site? This is all sorts of things. Anybody who's implemented this knows this is what you do. It works for pilots. It works for highly resourced settings where you share that kind of information. It does not scale. I think this has been the Achilles seal um, all the way back to the art and syntax days when like this part was left out in the curly braces. We keep kicking the can on this one. I think if we don't solve this, like everything is going to be built on a house of cards. So uh, I think this is super important. Um, and uh, this effort includes tooling to generate and leverage fire profiles. And I do think uh, phenotypic efforts, at least for scaling, will likely fail without this there. So my recommendation is work closely with Stan, work on SIMI. Um, uh, another uh, relevant effort is the Healthcare Services Platform Consortium, or HSBC. Uh, this uh, effort includes efforts to build and share interoperable fire interfaces prior to native EPIC or other EHR vendor support. This is to say, we don't need to wait for the vendor to support what we need. We can build it and we can share it. And uh, uh, HSBC is uh, uh, engaged in that effort, and I think that's also really important because we don't, uh, 
you know, for your use cases or our use cases, we don't want to wait three years until the vendor supports it. We can support it now and share it with each other. And this just shows, for example, this uh, production smart on fire app that um, we have for Billy Ruby management. The only thing I'll note here is that a number of these items here that you see that are supported, we have to create custom interfaces for. So, for example, the phototherapy uh, that's in the nursing documentation that's uh, documented and shown here, that's a custom interface. Um, uh, here, uh, we have the mother's uh, labs, the blood type and indirect crumbs. That's a custom interface we built on uh, in Epic so that we can say, who is the mother of this patient? Now we're going to make a fire API call to that mother's record and pull in data. And we're going to be sharing all this kind of stuff to other Epic customers free and open source so that we can build. And I think this is the kind of thing the community can do to start saying, hey, how do we build on what the EHR, where the EHR is heading and still support our needs? Uh, I'll briefly go through the other ones. Uh, I have much less to say about these others. So in terms of machine learning and other uh, computational uh, techniques, so at least for scaling, I'd recommend focusing on basic approaches that are easiest to scale, such as role-based uh, processing of structured data. Again, not as relevant if uh, you're willing to do this in a highly resource environment, but in a lower resource environment, I think that's definitely the easiest. Uh, I think NLP, uh, machine learning, that kind of thing, is certainly useful. Well, we use it for a variety of use cases in our institution as well, but it's, it's definitely a higher bar and uh, more resource intensive. So I think it should be judiciously used. And I'd certainly synergize with other related efforts. I'm just mentioning here uh, an NCIU 24 grant where we're doing these kind of things, population health management, NLP, you know, all the, all, you know, asking patients questions, et cetera, and doing it on a standards-based stack that will open source. Um, and I think a lot of folks are doing similar kinds of things. I think we just don't generally collaborate um, because it's not a natural thing for us to do, right? It takes more resources. Um, and it's often not in the quote unquote scope of work that uh, we're tasked to do. Uh, last question on how can eMERGE assess phenotype comparability across diverse patient populations and diverse healthcare settings? Um, some recommendations, I do think, uh, and I agree, when you try to do this kind of work, machine learning, uh, NLP, the thing that always gets you is the amount of effort it takes to create the gold standard. So typical like operational conversation goes like, hey, Ken, I had this conversation last week. You know, can you uh, scale your no-show prediction model uh, across our uh, institution, and can you get it done by next week? Right? So that's the kind of the time scale a lot of the industry moves. And when you say, well, you know, it's going to take us 12 months to do the chart audits with physicians, to, they just say, OK, forget it. We're just going to do what we do. Right? So I think establishing gold standard phenotypes uh, in less costly approaches is probably the critical issue. Like once you create a data set, like you can hand it off to any like you know competent NLP person, machine learning person, and they can run their magic. The key is having that data set. So one thought here is you could leverage where significant effort has gone into establishing gold standards, like uh, uh, a a a the American College of Surgeons uh, NSQIPS uh, registry. There's also you know, we make fun of billing data, but there are certain kinds of billing data that institutions spend a lot of effort to make sure they get right. Because if they don't get it right, they'll get a compliance issue. And if they do get it right, for example, you can get like $4,000 additional on an inpatient admission, for example. So I'd say, you know, look for areas where people are spending effort to do uh, gold standard chart audits, recognizing that in a lot of institutions, there's dozens of people running around manually chart auditing things. And the question is, well, why not leverage it if it matches your use cases? Um, uh, George already touched on this, but uh, manual phenotyping efficiencies, I think, is important. Um, I'll just note that uh, you know ourselves included have uh, tried to figure this out because we needed to figure out a more efficient way to do this in low resource settings and found things like, you know what, it actually makes sense in certain circumstances to provide the results of the uh, electronic phenotyping to the reviewers so that they can be uh, quicker about finding um, uh, potential errors and, and, uh, and such. And you know, I, I think this is, a, again, a critical piece. The phenotype, manual phenotyping is very expensive. And figuring out how to make it cheaper, I think, is really important. Um, uh, I think another important part is leveraging increasing EHR consolidation. So um, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it's well known, like, you know, if you count the EHR vendors that like 90% plus of us in this room are using, it's probably one or two vendors is my guess. So uh, I think just leverage that, right? So uh, when I take things like uh, queries we've written on our Epic Clarity database and share it with our other institutions to try to, you know, uh, 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 collaborate, more likely than not, it works. It just works and they just get the results back. And I, I think, 
you know, this is something that's, that's a good thing. I think we should uh, potentially focus on places where there's major EHR vendors and just come up with optimized ways of supporting those, uh, those technologies. Because I think it could, be a short, it, it could be a shortcut compared to the amount of mapping you might uh, require in certain use cases. Uh, so just to uh, uh, summarize, and I think I'll be about 45 seconds over. <laughs> Um, I think the biggest one, uh, bar none, is learn from and synergize with related efforts, acknowledging that it sounds nice, but we almost never do it. There's almost no funding ever around that says, hey, you want, we want you to work with other people who are working on similar things that's not in your network. It just almost never happens. I've seen it over and over again. People, it, it's just a hard thing to do. Uh, and then the rest are um, uh, uh, what I discussed. I think the key thing. Uh, keeps coming down to try to figure out how to collaborate with other people that you don't typically collaborate with. Think, think of things like how do you go to HL7 and collaborate. I, like a lot of the people in this room I, I've like never seen at HL7, for example. Um, there are some folks from eMERGE I, I know who go there, but it's, it's the kind of thing that a certain number go, um, and I'm not saying that nobody goes, but I, I think it's the kind of place where it takes effort, it takes resources, but collaborating with others, working on similar things is really, really important. Thank you.